Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bollywood Cinema Club, a show where we take a look at Indian cinema every other week. I am your host, Chris Stashu, of the Culture Cast, where this show was spun off from. On this episode of the show, I am joined by my good friend. She is here all the way from where, where she sets up shop on the internet. Your friend and mine, Mondo Heather's own Heather Drain. Good evening, everybody. I think tonight is going to be a thriller. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think tonight is going to resemble something that we've seen before, but... Uh, you know, like a, a not great version of. It. <laughs> yeah, why, like way, way, way too long. <laughs> yeah, God, yeah, for boy, yo, yeah. On this episode, we're going to be talking about a movie that is, uh, up until recently, was rather hard to find with English subtitles, but yet on YouTube, about a year and a half ago, somebody finally posted a 4K rip of this film with subtitles. You can find it in the link for the episode if you want to listen along or join in the discussion in your head because we're going to be talking about. 1994's Mahakal, otherwise known as Mahakal the Monster. So the film is directed by Shyam Ramsey and Tulsi Ramsey, and it stars Karan Shah and Archana Paran Singh as Prakash and Anita, two teenagers, question mark? <laughs> sure. Let's put some big old quotation marks around there. <laughs> some teenagers <laughs> who, who fall asleep at night and a man with a glove with finger knives on it torments them. Yes, this is actually a remake or reimagining, or as Wikipedia puts it, plagiarized. <laughs> yeah, Liz plagiarist. So rude. So yeah. rude. Of, of, <laughs> of, of A Nightmare on Elm Street, the 1984 Wes Craven film. But I think we've got plenty to say about the inspirations for this film because it's not just A Nightmare on Elm Street number one. At all. Specifically, there are some things that are from the second and third movie. So, but we're talking about a movie that is really, and again, I, I don't think I want to put it this way, but to get someone's attention, it is Indian, a nightmare on Elm Street. And, and that does get people's attention. In fact, this is um, one of the, I'm trying to think if this is the first film you and I've discussed that actually has a recent U.S., like legit Blu-ray release, or it's either Blu-ray or DVD, but Massacre Video have released it. And um, and they do good work. But if you're going to support them, and you should, I recommend buying another movie from them. <laughs> oh, spoiler. Uh, they have Hack-O-Lantern on that label. And Hack-O-Lantern is a joy, complete joy. Well, it's sold. It's sold out on Massacre Video, which is, is why, it? which is why I didn't mention them because I'm totally assuming somebody just ripped it and threw it on YouTube. Which is, um, which is, hey, which if is, it's sold out, mate, you gotta make do. Oh, what a shame! Do. I gotta what? watch is it Hack on YouTube. Lantern sold out. People should have bought Hack a Lantern. That's bullshit. I, I don't <laughs> think anyone should be buying I'm, this movie. I'm, th I'm throwing shade. On all of you that spent your hard-earned coffers on Mahakal when you could have been buying a better Indian movie or hack a lantern. <laughs> <laughs> so Heather, tell me what what you thought about Mahakal, aka a Indian remake of. I don't want to play call it plagiarize. It's a remake. Like it. It's a reimag. I would say reimagining it because it it takes liberties. I mean, it's not like a plagiarism. Jesus Christ, like. Right. I mean, granted, if this was if Harlan Ellison and I love Harlan, R.I.P. If he was still alive and they did this to one of his stories, that they would get sued. They would, uh, and, and he would probably win. So maybe it, it's fair. it's great. It's a great it, it's great area. Um, what did I think? I'll start with the positives first because I don't like being a negative Nelly. Um, there is like when you have the horror sequences, the lighting, like there's some really good lighting. Some of the camera works really good, like their use of color. Um, the mutated version of Charles Bernstein's, and I hope I'm saying his name right, the original, the, the man who composed the original Nightmare on Elm Street score, they do like a mutated version of it that has stings that are very similar to it, but that's kind of cool. Um, because that's just a great piece of music. Um, so I liked that. Uh, the uh, did I mention some of the camera works? <laughs> there. Oh my god! I th this film, and I usually I I'm okay with some tonal whiplash. And you and I have we've we've dealt like when we saw uh, I believe M Muthu. Yeah, it was all over Muthu the place had a little bit, but but Muthu was like jubilant, and it was so good. Like you're down with the ride, but that's the thing for a film to do that. You better be well, probably not a horror movie. <laughs> like horror is so hard. It is one of the harder genres to do, right. from, you know, to do right in any country. Um, so when you have tonal whiplash and horror, it's kind of like doing that in comedy, too, where it's like everything's ha ha, huck yuckin. 
And then, by the way, the baby's dead. And it's like, why? Like, right. what the fuck? You can't. So this film has so much tonal whiplash. I it, it gets to the point where it's kind of exhausting and you're just kind of done with it. Um, there's some characters that wear out their welcome. <laughs> um, That's a nice way of putting it. Uh, the very, uh, I'm trying to think of the best word for this. Um, like, uh, the treatment of, of sexual assault is is yes. a lot yes. it's a lot and and that's coming from somebody who's watched a lot of 80s material that it was a lot in that department right. like i'm definitely not gonna because i know it'd be easy for a western to be like oh well it's india well in india it does have a problem certainly with how women are treated but so does this country so nobody needs to judge so I to say like yeah let, let's point fingers yeah at ourselves <laughs> yeah but meanwhile while teenage girls are getting their their periods tracked if they want to be on a sports team so uh so no judging it's a judgment free zone here we're not assholes we are we are libertines we are celebrators of great art which I'm is a, not i my prefer fault. to be i prefer to be <laughs> referred to as a decadent philistine I like that you best like you should have your own brand of or something <laughs> and a ruffled shit <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i do but but chris what did you think about mahakal I wanted to like it. I think you did as well, obviously. Oh, like, absolutely. I wanted to love it. Right. Like, and, you know, I think that's that may have my enthusiasm may have finally uh, kind of gotten the best of me, I think, in a lot of ways. Like I went into this with no expectations. I had actually, you know, there's kind of an interesting history with me in this movie. This is a movie that Cullen Gallagher, who, you know, I know yeah. he's on the first episode of this show. And he's one of the biggest supporters of Indian cinema that I know, because, again, like he's he's been the one that was in my ear early on. Like, you should do this all the time. So. Like right it was on. it was advantageous and also kind of like, you know, prescient that he was saying that. But one of the movies that him and I had talked about many moons ago was Mahakal. But up until it was re-released recently, you could not find a English subbed version. It just didn't exist. You would have to pay someone to to do the translation for you. And Damn. and yeah, and like that it's not worth it. Like it's not that it's not well, it's not that it's not worth it, but I mean it's not worth it. Like it is. I don't know how to put it, but I'm not trying to be mean, but I can't I can't abide translating a movie that I don't know the quality of. Right. Well, and this one, like I I hate to think that there's going to be like a Westerner that this is their 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 entry into Indian cinema. Like that actually come, kind of bothers me because this journey that you have taken me on throughout the series. I probably have said this every episode because every single time, and some movies we've talked about are better than others, of course, but every single time I am like so grateful and it makes me want to just research more and and watch more because, you know, it's it's rewarding. Indian cinema is a rewarding thing as a whole, but like anything, some rewards are better than others. Sometimes, sometimes you get the golden ticket and sometimes you get pencil shavings with a with a wad of chewing tobacco on it. That looks and like it, chocolate. That uh, it ain't chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it don't taste like chocolate, <laughs> but it's crunchy. Oh, <laughs> but, but um, I guess my question to you is: but before we delve too far into the movie, that plot is so close to Nightmare on Elm Street, we're more or less probably going to be just comparing it. Unfortunately. Can this film be seen as anything other than a novel? That's what I'm curious. And that was the question I was trying to see if the film could give me an answer to, or at least inform an answer that I could come to while I was watching it. Because again, like yourself, I am a engaged viewer of film and you're expecting analysis to some extent. And that's one of the questions I went into this movie with is, is there a way to watch this movie and enjoy it without it inherently just being a novelty? Because, oh, it's Indian Nightmare on Elm Street. Like it. It ends up, in my mind, being that because it's not really trying to do more than that. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think, unfortunately, because of the way this movie is made and especially because some of the just again, just like some of the you'll have like something really serious and like you'll have like a really cool nightmare scene. And then there's like, you know, a character um, who works at the college canteen who's uh and I can't remember his name. I want to call him Johnny River, but I know Johnny, it's not Johnny, the, Johnny, Johnny River. Johnny River says, Amer thank you. Johnny River was like a American stinker from the 50s. Uh, We've seen like, him before. Thank you. Was he in Muthu? He was an or Ish. He was an Ish. Oh, he was, he was, he was, um, oh my God. He was an Ish. I kept trying. He was the, 
Oh, he was the guy that owned the shop. One of the shop. Who was he in Ishk? I'm trying to remember. He was like the brother-in-law of Shit. one of them. Shit. You're right. Yeah. You're right. And he was awesome in Ishk. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was, we, I remember you and I both liking him in Ishk. This is very much like, not like super early in his career, but he starts acting in 82 and this is in 94. So, yeah. he, I mean, he's known at the time. There's a reason they're casting him because he is, Johnny Lever is one of the, considered to be a, a, a one of the first Indian stand-up comedians. So, oh, wow. Now, I did see something, and I don't, I can't fact check it, that this film was actually shot in the 80s. But Would that surprise you? No, because it looks 80s. It looks right. very, it, I mean, even like the films, and that's not a bad thing, the film stock, I actually like how this film looks. That's one of the few positives I have to say about it. But um, yeah, and, uh, but yeah, but we see him come out and you hear like a little like thriller sting and he comes out kind of doing this permutation. Again, it's uh, everything's kind of permutated. Of Michael Jackson, but he's pretty funny. But then it's like kind of a gay panic thing, which they really kind of lean into in one of the musical numbers where he's trying to blow up a beach ball and he looks sexually frustrated. And it, it, I don't, it's a, I don't even, I don't even know. Like there's so many things in this, in this movie, Chris, where I was just sitting there going, what? And that's me. Like this is somebody who has made a entire lifetime of trying to find and be a curator of, of, esoteric cinema you know i kind of live for things surprising me but sometimes this surprised me in ways that i that didn't work i think is the problem and and that's the thing is this film was a better movie that i would say it could escape the whole like comparison i mean i think there still would always be people that would be like oh it's the indian nightmare on elm street but i think it would be evaluated a lot better if it was a better movie right you can you can do a remake you know even if it's kind of a ripoff well, I mean, look at the, like in 1931, they made a Spanish language version of Dracula, like at nighttime when they weren't, when Todd Browning and his crew weren't using that set. So it's the same sets. I mean, that's not a ripoff because it's studio, but yeah, but it's different actors, different directors, and pretty much historically it's considered a superior movie. Right. Except that it's like, you know, it doesn't have Lugosi. Like Lugosi is kind of like the one factor you can't, I mean, come on, he's Bell Lugosi. But, but it's very well regarded because everything else is so well, like it's such a well-made movie. Right. This is not Mahakal. Mahakal is like the tonal whiplash where it's like, hey, it's goofy. You know, it's funny. Just cheer up. Let's go to the park. Here's this guy that wants to rape our, our heroine. Oh, just cheer up. Like her, she's literally almost viciously, violently sexually assaulted in public. In like in a cafe. Yeah. And her friends are like, oh, you just need to get over it and cheer up. Here, we'll go to the lake. I mean, what the fuck? Just get over it and cheer up. <laughs> what the? F- I mean, I, I, I just, I, it's stuff like that that make this film like you can't. Unfortunately, the film itself will not let you evaluate it, I think, as its own thing. Does that make sense? Like, because the stuff that's not attached to Nightmare on Elm Street is so. I mean, the best stuff in this film is the stuff attached to Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> I think that's the other issue. Well, that's and that's. I mean, I that's I I'm total agreement with you. For me, it's you know that's kind of what I was driving at. It's this idea that like the movie sets itself. It, it it's like anything else, right? It sets itself up with the biggest boulder possible to push up the hill, and then by it being a Nightmare on Elm Street thing. It's a big boulder, but then you're remaking it essentially straight up. So it's essentially instead of an incline, it's like a vertical cliff face. Like, what the fuck are you going to do? Like, you've made it so hard for yourself to land this movie just based on what this is that like it it would take someone clearly much more adept at writing a story than what we get here to really do a good job with this story. Look, there is another Bollywood film that came out Five years before this one, Kuni Murda, which is another Indian cinema version of A Nightmare on Elm Street. I haven't seen that one. I would be curious, but this is the more well-known one. I mean, this is the mm. this is the one. I mean, again, like you mentioned, it got a re-release. And, you know, I think that's, for me, that is the most disappointing part, is that we get a movie that the Nightmare on Elm Street part's not great, but it ends up being better than the other stuff, which is not in a front, but it's... Um, it, it, it's barely entertaining if it is at all like n- none of none of the actors i would say have a fair amount of like they're not given much to do so they're even if they are charismatic i don't know yeah yeah and that's kind of the that's the sad thing is like because at first yeah you know, it's one of those things where okay 
maybe the acting isn't as good. But then like the more you get into it, it's like, well, actually, the actors are fine. Uh You know, it's just the material. I mean, you have to be like, you know, you'd have to be like an Amir Khan or if we're going to use like a European example, like a Christopher Lee. Like you have to be like somebody who is just like a gold tiered charisma bomb to rise above shit material. Most can't do it. Even like even really talented people can't do it. I mean, look at Phantom Menace. Like, no offense to anybody. Don't come for me. Okay. <laughs> if you love it, that's cool. But in my personal opinion, there are there are actors in that movie that are really great actors in other movies, but seem kind of stiff and wooden in it. You right. know? And I don't think anybody's it. gonna ever give George Lucas an award for writing dialogue. They shouldn't, unless it's a rask. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> what? Wait. <laughs> oh, oh, he can go cry on his bed made of money. He's yeah, fine. True. His billions He's, of dollars. I, I love when people get all hurt. Like, oh, how did you say that about? Oh, the man who could buy and own your because he has more money than. Yeah, he's fine. It's true. It's true. He did sell it to Disney and we should feel yeah. bad for him. Go go worry about recycling your number two plastics and donating to a homeless shelter. Okay, worry about real shit, guys. Well, Heather's Truth. coming for everybody. T-bomb. Uh, this movie made me cranky. I'm sorry. It just made me so salty because it was so it was so long and the music wasn't that good. And that's the other problem is, I mean, I don't, I don't think the music sucked. I will say that. I think this is probably one of the weakest musical entries that we've you and I have talked about. Well, and that, you know, there there are three songs. Mm -hmm. And they're all, why in God's name they didn't have a song that the monster sings is beyond me. Look, I mean, let's, let's, we haven't even really talked about this yet, which should serve as a sign to those of you listening along. Um, The monster, Shakal, as he is Mm -hmm. so aptly named, played by Mahavir Bular, um, is the biggest missed opportunity because Freddy Krueger talks and he oh, he's talks, a big personality. Right. Like, and he talks in one, two, three. And then after three, he doesn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> and like, that's part of the character. And I say all this because, yes, this movie may have been shot in the 80s, but this movie came out in 1994. And I know for a fact, as do you, because we're both fans of the franchise, there are things from the other, at least Nightmare 2 and 3, that show up in this movie, which means they had to have seen and made this movie at least after 1987. Because there is a sequence in this movie that is directly from Dream Warrior. It's either Dream Warriors or Dream Master. The thing where the, with, with the bed, with the water bed, like that's from A Nightmare on Elm Street. yeah. Actually, like, I think the waterbed's from one, isn't it? Because that's where Johnny Depp gets killed. No, no. Johnny Depp gets sucked down into it. But there's a waterbed sequence where the kid gets trapped in the water. Oh, oh, no, you're right. You're right. Because, you know, uh, and that's um, oh, that what's four? the one that has it's the one that's got the Vinnie Vincent invasion on the soundtrack. <laughs> so it's I think that's four. Yeah, because Dawkins on the Dream Warriors. And that's three. It right? is four. It is four. Yeah, it's four then. You're right. Oh, my God. Yeah, because they show the girl in the waterbed in the right. video for Love Kills. Right. Oh. And she's topless in the American version here. Yeah. It's not that's not the case, because, again, a, a little bit more conservative. But that is straight out of four, which came out in 88. So yeah. this movie was made sometime in between 88 and 94. So oh, my, my point right. more is less like, oh, they saw the first Nightmare on Elm Street and were like, hey, that's Freddy Krueger. Let's do that. It's like. They saw all of them and didn't decide, yeah, Freddy Krueger can clearly talk, so why don't why don't we have him talk? Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing is that the monster isn't we're not really we're not we're not really given a lot of him. And what's weird is they kind of I feel like they kind of go a little more blatantly into his backstory than we got with Freddy and one, certainly. Where yeah, and one we know that he was, you know, a child killer and, and all that. He was but a kid diddler. He was a you. kid diddler. I, I legit have had fans argue with me about like, oh, he just killed the like guys. I I don't want to be that dark person, but I mean, if you look at true crime, people that prey on kids to kill them are doing other things. You know, it's disgusting. It's disturbing. I don't like thinking about it either. But also, you're defending Fred Freddy Krueger. It's kind of like people being like, you know. Well, you know, Dracula, Dracula doesn't lack dudes. I'm okay with him drinking baby blood. <laughs> but, you know, did you not hear that when the BBC did their version of Dracula a few years ago and a bunch of, like, fanboys were complaining because Dracula's bisexual? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
and which still cracks i'm like really like okay why would he care if if you were immortal you wouldn't care also you're home a you're homophobic b dracula's not real so he could literally be anything he wants right not a real character it's like being like if fictional characters fictional (laughs) characters they're not real yeah um but i i digress yeah they don't really do a lot um and the design <laughs> i don't know I, i'm trying to i've been trying to figure out if i like the design or not because at times he looks kind of like a burn victim chris Catan with the mullet <laughs> his hair the hair is the hair is it for me like that's where that's where I, I that's where i'm on board is the hair he's got like totally like this light mullet like a black mullet other times he kind of looks like like that like a like a cheap version of trickster from brain scan <laughs> oh yeah and oh you know, yeah totally okay see that's the but yeah why isn't he talking like freddie and i'm not saying he has to do monologues or anything but like but even <laughs> in, even even in one which when freddie was still legit scary and not like a cartoon character um yeah, he would say little things like, I have your boyfriend now, Tina, you know, and you're like, fuck, that's terrifying. Yeah. And this guy doesn't really like my, you know, Chacal, even though we get like, we get it really, there's a great set design of his like, you know, sacrificial area where he kills children to build his powers in the black arts. And like, they definitely go harder, I think, on the whole child killing thing than the Nightbreed Elm Street did. But um well, we actually see it. We see yeah. like, a kid, and we see him throwing uh, Anita's sister, like I guess, into the the, the, the fire pit, the well hey. of souls. Like I don't know, like what? It was like a giant oh. circle tube that just goes somewhere that you can't return from. Can we form a metal band called Tube of Souls? <laughs> soul tube. Soul tube. We are soul tube, and this is our forty-five minute jazz odyssey. Oh my god! It is the. The second coming of Soul too, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the monster. Uh, also, um, the characters we get. I think that's the other thing. It's like with Diver and Elm Street, at least you know, especially those first few, like say like one to four. You like all the characters. You kind of you don't want these kids to get, even though you know some of them are going to get it. And it's not that you don't care about our main protagonists in this film, because I think the actors, you know, are largely likable, but everything like the pacing is like a like on cocaine it's like on pure fucking amphetamine <laughs> that you can't focus enough you know so it's like do you even really know these characters this movie's so two hours long and they still feel like they're sketches they don't feel like people to me you know no i i completely agree i mean and even i mean even shakal feels the same way it's you know i was i was sitting and watching it and all i could think to myself was even when Nightmare on Elm Street has a moment of levity to it, and there are some, I mean, there are, you know, ooh, stuff like that. I mean, I mean, that's the Johnny Depp. I mean, Johnny Depp's character is a lot of the comic relief. Yeah. But, I mean, there is comic relief in that movie. It's still a horror movie, and it feels like a horror movie with bits of comedy in it. This movie is tonally not a horror movie. It is a teenage slice of life rom-com adjacent with a monster and in a lot of ways it more or less speaks to in my mind and again like there aren't a lot of them and it's not like a it's not a genre that is very well represented indian horror films just it's not as big of a genre as it is in western cinema like it just the the representation is not there the way it is here and i i i wonder why i I, again like i haven't been able to suss out specifically why but it's not as big of a genre. And I wonder if it's because like tonally, it's hard to land a film with musical numbers that's also a horror film. Because a lot of the horror movies that are coming out now are sans a lot of the typical things you would expect from an Indian horror film or an, or an Indian film in general. Like Tumbad, which we talked about, Father Malone and I, uh, several episodes back. No musical numbers at all. None. And it's like an hour and 45 minutes. Like it's not even... It's not this like expansive narrative too. It's an expansive narrative, but it's not two and a half hours. Right. And like, it seems like in a lot of ways, at least best I can suss out, some of it may just be horror movies are hard to do if you're trying to transpose your own style onto them because sometimes the restraints of horror are not willing to bend in that direction. Sometimes they just can't bend in that direction. And like maybe Mahakal having Shakal do a dance 
and kind of do his thing, maybe that would change my tune. But even they didn't think it, it could work, so they didn't even try it. Maybe it would have worked, but I don't know. We, we we don't know anything about the villain in this movie more than what they give us. And what they give us doesn't feel like enough. And what they give us about our heroes doesn't feel like enough either. It's just like it, the movie just kind of floats from scene to scene. Yeah. Well, and the thing I hate, because you're, I mean, all the points you just made are, are, are spot on. But I hate it because I think somebody, I, I think you could do it. But the problem is like to 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 weave in musical elements in a horror film without it feeling just like somebody throwing a you know cold water in your face. Like you'd have to kind of just keep you'd have to keep the the tone and you could have humor. I mean, Return of the Living Dead is a movie that's a perfect example of having like you could have moments that are really brutal and at times even really sad and bleak. There's some the, the stuff that's funny is fantastic, and there's a great use of music in it too. Um, it's not musical, but the music in it's super important. But I mean, I think you could totally. I would love to some to see somebody do that. And I was trying to think of like top of my head of musical numbers that work in a creepy way. That's like and and it's weird, but like there's that whole thing with the sirens and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Okay, and sure. that that has almost like a sinister undertone, and that's really beautifully done. That's obviously not a horror movie, but I think you could do it. But yeah, you know, it, it like you said, it's it's hard, and I think it's just hard in general to do good horror. I mean, there's so many, and I love I'm a monster kid, but there's so many horror movies out that you know are just so rote, you know, and maybe that's kind of the problem with the. I don't even know. It's just, have you yeah, seen this, Have you seen 2014 Stage Fright? The movie that has like meatloaf and mini driver in it. I saw I've seen a review of it. I have not actually seen it. I'm more familiar familiar with the Michele Suave stage fright, which is fucking awesome and is a masterpiece, but I've not seen the meatloaf one. It's it's interesting. It's a horror musical. Mm-hmm. And like it it works more or less. Like again, I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh, it's the best movie I've ever seen. But like again, like it's sh- in my mind shows that you can kind of get away with it like again if, if you also if you buy into the premise like if you the creator are just like going for it like you got to just go for it like and that's why i i think you would agree like in my mind to go for it in this movie is to have the monster sing is yeah. to have oh the mo- my god don't yes. have the monster not be part of the story since when in indian cinema is the villain not given some some characterization like that is it Clearly, it's surprising to you as well that the villain of this film gets no characterization. Because, like, I-, I can think of a movie like the sequel to Entheron or Doom 3 or Doom 2 or, uh, God, uh, even Pathan, where it's like these villains are as well fleshed out and realized as our heroes are. And that is something that I consider to be a positive for Indian cinema is that they take the time and go to the lengths to give you a reason to maybe even see from the villain's point of view. And in this, it's like, nah, he's just a bad guy. Yeah. He he la- he cackles evilly. <laughs> and that's it. Like, it's so lame. It's like a bad haunted house. And right down to throwing... <laughs> Actually, I don't think that's part of it. The, one of the nightmares, the girl, like, skeletons are thrown on her. Oh, yeah. I don't know why that made me laugh. It was, it was, it was cute. It was I, cute. I, you know, I, I, I was thinking... You know, comparing this because the reason we watch this, you remember why we're watching this, right? Well, yeah, we wanted to do a horror movie, right? But, but also because in Ishk, there is a scene with like a horror scene with Amir Khan. Remember? <gasps> oh, it was so good. It was. Oh, see, you just lifted my spirits because you you reminded me of that that great scene and Amir Khan. So it's like win win. And Johnny Lever was in that movie, so yeah. that's so that's why we're doing this. But I I remember you know you and I talking like. Oh, Indian horror. And it's like, you know, this this is a poor example of a Indian horror movie, but that's not really the point. This is a poor example of a horror movie. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it's it, it being from India is almost just more of a factoid, really, than a, yeah. than a factor in my. Right. You know, and it's and it's weird because it's like I, d- I definitely think it's also and, and not in a good way. And I mean, it's still I mean, India is a much more conservative country. Yes. But if this is kind of the sleaziest film we've done. There's a lot of like leering and a girl gets her ass slapped. Um, you know, there's literally a zoom in on on poor uh, Anita's boobs. Like they're clothed. You don't there's no nudity or anything. Right. It's not it's not really sleazy for it's not sleazy by American standards for sure. But is there nudity in the original nightmare? Um I guess there's there's underwater breasts at one point which aren't Heather Langen camps. Yeah. 
it, I'm assuming that's a body double in that scene because she was like barely of legal age. So yeah, yeah, it had to been a body double. I hope. I don't know. God, it was the eighties. Who knows? There's not, <laughs> I mean, there, there, there's not there's not any nudity in that first nightmare. But again, like this movie. See, here's the thing that feels like the big missed opportunity. Again, that's why I mentioned when this movie came out and when this movie had to have been filmed at least post ninety seven. Like they have every Nightmare on Elm Street movie to mine from. Yeah. Outside of New Nightmare, which again, for me, that that one is as important as the first one is. But mm-hmm. they don't have that one to draw from. But they have all the other ones, and they. And instead of really doing a real amalgamation of the movies into something uniquely Indian, they just go, we're going to retell the first movie and throw in a couple nods to the second and third movie. Because, it, you know, in the second, in the in the Nightmare on Elm Street gay edition, the second movie, um, they have this whole thing about him being possessed by Freddy. And that's what happens to Anita in this movie is she's possessed by Chacal at one point. Right. Just like Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And it's like, okay, so you've seen that movie then. So you know Freddy Krueger talks. So why does Chacal not talk? It's just like, it's such a strange choice because it, it it is it is a obvious intentional choice and it doesn't feel like the right one to the point where it really detracts from my ability to enjoy the movie or even understand what YV Tiagi saw in the original movie that made them think like, this is a movie I want to remake and let me do these things. It's like, man, like you really didn't even stretch. You didn't even really push yourself to do much in a lot of ways. It doesn't feel like much of anything. No, no. Well, and it's like, it's it's also like kind of taking like obvious things and not, but not understanding how they work, which is why a lot of like, like it's hard, it's harder to find really great remakes in general because a lot of times people will remake a movie, they'll be like, you know, they'll take the obvious things, but they don't even bother to study why did this work? Like with two, that character, he had legit angst over being like, what's wrong with me? Am I killing people? And I don't know it. And, you know, you you care about him. Like you're legit worried about him and you don't want him put in a situation. You know, when Anita gets possessed, and by the time that happens, you're just like, okay, cool, whatever. And I mean, even though there is like this whole thing where the... This bad guy that's called, I guess, the boss, who uh, at one point, I have to make a comment on this, uh, is wearing a blue collared shirt, like an Izod type collared shirt that's got Iron Maiden. He's a cool guy. Uh, but I've never legit. And I I mean, I one of my best friends at junior high was a metalhead. Like, I love heavy metal. I'm very familiar with the culture. I have never seen a collared Iron Maiden shirt in my life. Are you like, saying that we should like have some made? Uh, for us like matching no would that, would that hurt would that hurt our style it would just make me think of this movie our our style being all black all the time <laughs> yeah we're more of the goths we need goth collared shirts and we'll have baja or sister some mercy oh i thought it. you were gonna say like baja men uh who let the dogs out <laughs> Chacal did yeah that that scamp <laughs> yeah that, that imp but um, and that's it. And it's like there's the whole thing where this guy sees he goes to a club and sees this act, but he keeps seeing Anita like miming to it. And I actually think that's actually probably the better musical number because of the editing. And like, that's kind of a cool idea where it's almost like, is he hallucinating? Is she messing with him because she's possessed by Chacal? Like the seeds there are good, but it's like everything that's and I get frustrated with movies like this where. There are seeds that are really cool, but everything is such a mess. Right. And it's not stitched together like it should be that you get you just get really frustrated. Also, this guy legit doesn't understand why she doesn't like him. Even he tried to rape her. Like, uh, I mean, I try, talk about not reading the room. Like, hey, I- I- anybody listening, if you want somebody to like you, don't assault them. Right. It's pretty easy. Like, it's, don't assault anybody, really. I mean, that's that's terrible. Like, and just don't don't be an asshole. You know, don't do well, that. And that for me, I think, <laughs> is kind of the <clears throat> excuse me. That for me is kind of the big issue with this movie is I, I didn't find any of the characters characters likable. I didn't find them easy to get invested in and or quote root for against Shakal. They they just they seem to be kind of just as surprised and confused as we are. I mean, in the original movie. It seems like the parents know more than they're letting on and that they're doing their best to protect their kids, but not really. They think they, they do what they're doing, what they think is right. Right. Mm-hmm. There's none of that here. It's just like the, this guy keeps killing us and we don't know why. And then by the end of it, it's like, well, uh, 
By the way. <laughs> yeah, like Shakal killed your sister and killed a bunch of kids. But like, how does Shakal die? How did Shakal become Shakal? Like, that's not an answer that is given in the movie. And it's not one that's needed to be given. But it's a part of the framework of the original movie as to why he's doing what he's doing. It's never made clear. He's just doing it because whatever. But like that, I guess. But that's not particularly interesting like even in the original movie it's not particularly interesting like it's just those kids happen to go to that school and this guy happened to be there there's nothing interesting about it and that's kind of what makes it work but then again like what really makes it work is that the parents are so kind of still invested in like well we don't want to even know what is going on and we're hiding and we have the glove and the hat in the furnace like all of that is part and parcel to the original story because that's how you find out how Freddy Krueger has it in for them. There's none of that here. There's not even a character's motivation as to why our villain is doing what he's doing to the heroes of the piece. Well, and also, like, the parents aren't nuanced characters here. Because, like, in in the original, like, you like both of Nancy's parents. Like, her mom, you know, seems like a good person, and she seems kind of haunted, and you understand why. Like, especially once you find out more of the details, but it's a good performance. And, of course, her father's John... excuse pardon my french even though i cuss all the time john motherfucking saxon because he is the man right oh my oh he is like my american american i love I, I almost blush saying john saxon i love him but nancy's dad is not like D- her dad's a good dad like he's skeptical and he's a cop and he's a man but he also just you know he's not coming from a bad place like he cares but he's clueless but he's not an asshole uh, anita's dad in this movie is just straight up did her dad is not a good person like if a cab exists in india it's probably because of people like her dad right her dad and he doesn't redeem because like you find out all her sister died and it's like well, okay you can see that kind of fucking obviously i would fuck anybody up your kid died and and, and a violent of course we don't know at that point how she died but just losing your child i mean that's a that's heavy that's very heavy but her dad is so woody and it's yeah. just like Ugh, like that that is his whole level the entire movie is Ugh, like that noise that tension right there's no humanity to him, and it's not even funny i think that's the problem if this movie was just so over the top bad then it would be entertaining but it sits in an uncomfortable middle because you know and i i, I think that yeah, that hurts it too because you can't even really watch it for you know like camp purposes. I guess if you're going to watch a movie for that reason. Well, and and you know if we if we have one to one characters in the movie, the Johnny Lever character is a, a a addition to the mix that is not in the original series. That, that's, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we don't. <laughs> he's like trying the hardest. I feel like of anyone, but that's also because he's seemingly given the most to do. It's almost like he's the main character of the movie. Well, and he plays three different roles. Right. Like, great. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. Some of that stuff is so bizarre. But he does put an effort. And he, at least early on, after a while, that character kind of wears its welcome. And but, like the first or second scene. <laughs> yeah. But initially, it's like, oh, this guy, you know. But, uh, uh, and that's the other thing, too, is like, by the time you get to the late, later section, there's been another scene where two girls almost get raped in public. Um, Donnie Lever's character actually saves them while dressed as a character made famous by Amita. Yep. Like, I w- never movie filmmakers don't ever mention a, e- even an, an actor that would make your movie better. Don't mention them because Amitab, I'm like, Amitab could have lifted some of this shit. Right. And... And on top of that, I'm sure the movie that they're alluding to is got to be a lot better. <laughs> it's got to be. Well, it has Amitabh in it. Exactly. And uh, I, I do. And I do wonder, like, if this movie had gone the route of casting a well-known actor as the villain, if that would have been, oh, well, now we need to characterize the villain. And now he needs to be important. But it was like, well, we didn't cast anyone of note as Shakal, So... There you go. Like it's he's just going to be the villain then. And, and you know you know you mentioned the design of the character. His design I think is fine, but it is egregious that it is just the exact same glove painted gold. That is the one part of this movie that I do have a hard time forgiving it for cuz you've done effectively nothing creative with that glove. And it is so iconic on its oh. own. Like you can't help but just be like that's the glove from Nightmare on Elm Street. 
Yeah. Well, and and you know that's the the thing too is like even if the the actor isn't that well known, I mean Robert England wasn't a huge star. No. When he was cast, he was like kind of a supporting character actor at best. I mean, he'd done some notable roles. He was in the last detail and he had Toby Hooper's eaten alive, which is amazing. That was V as well. He was in V. Yeah. I mean, so he was, you know, he was a working actor, but I don't, he definitely wasn't a household name, but the thing is England being the great character actor he is, is one of those guys that can bring a presence and a kind of demented charisma. Like, he's not charismatic as Freddy in a sexy way, obviously, but he's charismatic in a way that, you know, you could feel. And that's what makes Freddy kind of so scary, too. It's like anybody could be some goon that's like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to haunt your dreams. Right. Biatch. Well, I say biatch, but, you know, but England, there's something about England that is very magnetic. And that's right. kind of what makes it even scarier is because you feel that pull with the repulsion. And that's right. like the sweet, that's a sweet spot with any kind of great, truly great villain or monster is that that un easy mix like a quicksand kind of thing and we don't we don't get that at all and it sucks because like some of the atmosphere like there were some talented people that worked on like on lighting and set design and and some of the camera works really good like there are some uh, there was some effort made but the rest of the movie doesn't match up with it so you know it's just kind of like a flat effect right well and and you know i you know looking into mahabir bular's career Still acting today, mostly known, I think, in India for being a, a supporting actor, supporting character and things. So, again, like you just said, I mean, it's not like the actor that they cast couldn't have given it more. I still think there was more to give it. I don't know. Uh, it just I think they I think they were focusing on the wrong things from Nightmare on Elm Street. Right? Agreed. Right. Agreed. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, with this film, I don't know if you did this, but I kind of like was thinking like well like if you and i were involved in the creative process <laughs> and be like okay let's do this first of all and they give us hints with this but they don't really get into it because it's they constantly refer to him as an evil spirit and at one point the mother who that actress by the way is only like five years older than the actress playing anita like i kept being like her mom looks amazing for her age and it's right, like, right 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 yeah because she's five years older than her uh but uh but like they meet like a guru or a master that gives her like an amulet that doesn't come into play at all for the rest of the movie. Um, Go figure. Yeah. But, uh, but like, what if they, and that'd be another way to kind of divide it a little better, more from a Craven film is lean it to mythology, make it like a, like an ancient demon kind of thing, like kind of make it, you know, lean into that aspect of it, make the musical numbers a little, make at least one of them a little scary, a little spooky, keep that tonal. The whole subplot with Rapey McRaperton, cut that shit out. This movie's too long as it is. It didn't add anything to it. Um, and you're not invested enough in anything to care when he finally does get killed, like either. And in a pretty know? lack and in a pretty lackluster way, I feel like. I mean, it's not yeah. it, it's, it's not I spit on your grave. Okay. Well, and I when I was watching it, I was like, Well, here's the Johnny Depp scene. I mean, yeah. it's like that's Dang. that's that's where you're like, he's on the bed, here we go. They subvert your expectations a little bit because all of a sudden it's the bed scene from a different movie, a different nightmare where it ends up being, you know, all oh, the waterbed and trapped in the waterbed. But like the the thing, like the, it almost feels like it was because of it, it was a technological limitation because that fucking room from Nightmare is not something anybody should be doing again. If you watch the Never Sleep Again documentary, it sounds like that was a nightmare when they did that that blood effect to the point where like the room tilted and shit was getting electrocuted and stuff like nobody should be recreating that. It's an amazing effect still to this day. Like it is yeah. an impressive effect in an impressive movie. But like if we judge this movie as a horror movie, it doesn't even have very interesting kills. Not that it needs it, but it doesn't even, like you said, do anything with the fact that it's an Indian horror movie because it totally should have been this is, you know, the God of Revenge or whatever, like something to that effect. A movie like Tumbad does it and where it's like it's it's a monster, but we're leaning on the folklore and the religion and the culture of India to inform what it is, which makes it, like you said, uniquely Indian. And this doesn't even feel Indian. That's the thing. Like it's an Indian remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street. 
but it just feels like a bad remake of a Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, in me, it's not with or without, like, the case. Like, it doesn't change anything. Yeah, yeah. This is a film, and obviously, you know, you're doing this podcast, and we've, we've talked about several films together. You and I are obviously not the kind of people that are, like, going to whine about a film being long. Like, if no. the movie's good, bring it. You know, we're down. But... But this one definitely, I think, was the the one that we've talked about that I really felt the length on. It just was too long. It was way, way too long because it wasn't that good. I mean, because some of the other films, we've just got some films that were a little long. It could have been trimmed, but it wasn't a deal breaker. You know, with this one, it's like, oh, my God, there's like B and C and D plots cut that shit out like just cut it out lean it up and give us a scary give us a scary musical number you can do that there's tons of music that's legit atmospheric and scary out there I don't I mean I know there's not a lot of precedence for scary musicals um, though you mentioning Stage Fright made me think of uh, Slumber Party Massacre 2 which does have a great musical number hmm. I love it with it with it's like a rockabilly number though it's so much fun but uh, I'm trying to think of like horror musicals there's like I mean Rocky Horror but not really Really? I mean, it has horror elements. Mm-hmm. Sweeney it's Todd. A, yeah. As sure. presented as presented by Johnny Depp and Tim Burton. Not like the stage play is kind of... The, like the stage play is a lot more like, like believe it or not, darker. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, like, well, it's like also very kind of like tongue in cheek too. And yeah. Like, it's more kind of like biting satire and less like Johnny Depp crooning as best he can or believes he Right. Well, and you don't have the pastiche of like the Tim Burton pastiche kind of thing going, which which is already horror adjacent. Yeah. Well, at this point, and I hate this because I love Tim Burton. This is an aside. I love Tim Burton as a teenager, and I still love like Beetlejuice is forever my jam. But uh, like, but after a while, it's like okay, I I know what merch is going to be a hot topic. <laughs> it's right. Like, you know, like you can just you can see it, but um. But yeah, no, that's a really good question. There aren't a ton, um, because Rocky Horror is kind of an intentional sort of camp homage to right. horror and science fiction and B movies. Um, I, uh, as I, I kind of, oh, um, what, what, would re, would, uh, repo the genetic opera count? Yeah, but Father Malone is rolling his eyes somewhere. I wasn't a fan of it either, but I get uh, it. I get but, it. But but I mean, we're talking. We're not talking about the ones we personally love. We're talking about just in general. What about so. um, Phantom of the Paradise? Yeah, you know that's so funny. I love and I love that movie with the fire of a thousand suns. Likewise, like and. I know. I never even think of it as horror because I just think of it as Phantom of the Paradise. Right. Well, but but it is. It's but, like one hundred percent. It's inspired by Phantom of the Opera, which is 100% horror. So Phantom of the Opera might be, it might be the the gold standard, because I can't think of a horror musical that, at least in my opinion, I think is better. I mean, you can't beat that soundtrack. Like, it's, no. Um, I mean, they, but, do a, they do a psycho. They do a psycho, like a little psycho oh, homage the in the movie. Like, I, I, it oh, knows what it is. Like, I love the Oh, it's great. Now I just gonna want to go watch. We should have watched. We should have watched Fan of the Paradise instead of Mahakal. Right? <laughs> oh goodness! But it's I'm a better musical. It's a better musical. I mean, shit. Even Repo, just a genetic opera, which I don't like. At least it's short. Right. Oh yeah. And Paul Sorvino that- really knows how to sing. Uh, <laughs> yeah all Sorvino singing in that movie is is it like woof. have you seen Tommy like Ken Russell's Tommy. No. Oh, you need to see it because I love Tommy, but Nicholson sings in it. And I was going to ask you which one you thought was the worst singer, Jack Nicholson or Paul Sorvino. I would submit for your approval a third. Ooh. Submit for your approval. Yes. Um, Pierce Brosnan and Mamma Mia. Oh, well, okay. that That's a horror movie in a different way. <laughs> right. Where are those happy days? Like, oh, God. Oh, Stop it, Pierce. Oh, Jesus. Pierce, no. What did Abba What did Abba do to you, Pierce <laughs> Brosnan? Show us on this doll where it touched your weenus, Pierce. <laughs> His he said weenus. <laughs> Pierce Brosnan's weenus. <laughs> but it, it's it's too bad. But you do make me want to explore. Like I almost feel like it's a challenge now. I feel like we need to find a horror movie that's from India that's really good that has a musical number. Right. It's got to exist, right? I mean, that's it, good. It has to. I mean, again, it's just, I guess the question is, and this is the thing that kind of we're, we're walking around here ultimately is how much of it can be a horror movie, mm-hmm. right? Because like it could have horror elements like Ishk did. Ishk had a horror scene. Doesn't make it a horror movie, right? Right. This movie's a horror movie because there are reoccurring horror scenes. But like, again, like it's a horror movie, but this movie's 
barely a horror movie. Like, it kind of, it barely works as a horror movie. It works better as like a slice of life teen drama. Yeah, yeah, we're using the word teen very loosely. Yeah. I mean, at one point when Anita, and, the, and it's not the actress's fault. The actress is fine. But she has a nightmare. She's crying for her parents. And, and there was one point where I totally expected her dad to be like, Anita, you're 30. <laughs> you're an <laughs> adult now. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I mean, did Heather Langenkamp and Johnny Depp look like adults in Nightmare? Yeah, they did. <laughs> but, Heather, but she was a teenager. Right. She but, legit was like 17, 18. Right. But like Johnny Depp looked like, I guess, I don't know. Again, like, he didn't look 30. <laughs> no, but he also didn't look like a teenager the way she did. Right. And no. I mean, Heather yeah. Langenkamp has like, has very soft features. So, yeah. And she's so good. Like, oh, that's yeah. the, but that's the thing is, Nancy, this is the, oh my God, you just made me realize this might have been the ultimate. Well, yeah, Deal Breaker is like with Nancy in the original, you get a protagonist that you don't, you, you not only care about, but she's intelligent. She is a fighter. She yeah. is savvy. She's like, the she best like, fucking scream queen of them all. She's a bad ass. You love her. And who's better? Like, who's better than Nancy? I don't, I, I like, who? I mean, she's, oof. She takes it to him in the first movie. She doesn't wait. Like, she tries. She could. She almost saves Johnny Depp in that movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, she's only, like, her and probably, like, Sigourney Weaver in, like, Aliens. Like, those two are, like, the badass yeah. mamma jammas. But I still go like, for Heather Langenkamp because that's, like, even if Alien is a horror movie, Nightmare on Elm Street is still pure horror, not well, sci-fi horror. Well, yeah, it's... God, they're both great, though. Right. Oh, like, it's like, yeah, it's no. like picking vanilla and chocolate ice cream. Like, you're I, not going to be disappointed either way. Exactly. No, and Heather Langenkamp, it's such a great performance because you you totally buy her being that resourceful. Like, by she helps you make make feel like that character. And Nita is basically... And I hate this because that actress, like, I would have loved to have seen her take that, you know, be given the opportunity to be like, you know what? Fight him. He is he has ruined your life. He's killing your friends. Like he's possessing your body at one point, which is rapey. I mean, what's more what's more rape than somebody invading you right. without your permission? That's rape. Um, and her fight back, and instead it has to be the men doing it. I mean, literally, when they have the big confrontation at the end, you know, her mother tries to run out at one point without like your baby girls, like well what is going on and it's like asshole dad and her boyfriend and again not i can't stress enough we're not blaming any of the actors it's the writing and direction I, they say it it's just bullshit it's bullshit it would be like if johnny depp's ghost saved the day and nightmare and not heather langenkamp it's, it's utter it's utter nonsense well and, and to your point i mean archana puran singh is given a raw deal here like she's not a remotely relatable protagonist like there's nothing about her that's like memorable even again heather langenkamp there's a reason she comes back in two other movies including the one that ends up being for me the nightmare movie and she's part of the trilogy of movies one three and new nightmare that i personally consider headcanon because that's a complete story told in three movies the original the sequel and then this is what was actually happening here it is in the real world like that awesome but that's a testament to Heather Langenkamp like, and her performance and her ability to be charming and charismatic and also, like like you said, believable. Mm -hmm. And it just shocks me that, like you said, our hero in this has no agency of her own. No. And, and that's the thing, too, is that we've seen, you and I have seen and talked about Indian movies that have strong female characters and strong female protagonists. I mean... Including Don Gall, which is literally based on a true story, you know, right. like, so it's not like, you know, it's a culture thing. Like, you can have a strong female in right. there, and it's just they choose not to do it. And her dad isn't really, I just, I, I didn't care for her dad. And it's just, it was weird. That whole confrontation was weird, because literally the boyfriend really is the only one trying to save her properly. Right, right. And like, you kind of think the parents... <laughs> They're, and it's almost like they're just like maybe we'll start fresh after this one gets sacrificed right <laughs> i mean it's terrible i i i wish this movie didn't feel like such a novelty like such kind of a af like it almost feels like the movie itself is an afterthought and they just wanted to get butts in the seats because it's a retelling of a story that is a western story but yeah. like 
guys, just watch the original. Like, don't even watch this. Because, like, again, like, this is beyond diminishing returns, but they don't do enough to even warrant this existing in a lot of ways. The original Nightmare on Elm Street is a classic for a reason. And it will always be. It has stood the test of time. And it will stand the test of time, no matter how many times they remake it, no matter how many sequels they make, it's still the best out of all of them. Even if even if my favorite is New Nightmare, the original is solid front to back. There's nothing wrong with that movie. As far as I'm concerned, it's almost a perfect. It's a masterpiece. Right. It's a masterpiece. It's, just thinking it's... about the blood scene alone, like that is just like, yeah, like everything about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, even even after watching this, you know, this, you know, and you and I both, like you mentioned, we love the series. And even after seeing Freddy become kind of like, yo, like this weird anti-hero. And I mean, there was like Freddy Krueger dolls and Great like games. Yeah. Like I love but, Freddy, though. But like, it's I weird do, to root I do, for too. It. It's super weird. But you can still even with knowing all that, you can still go back and rewatch the first one. And it still has that effect. Like, it's such a great horror movie. And it's scary. The first movie is scary. It's legit scary. And I mean, it, honestly, I, I I, mean, that whole tongue coming out of the pho- phone thing, that fucked with me as a kid. I saw that movie at way too young of an age. But <laughs> and I was so afraid anytime I answered the phone, like Freddie was going to try and French me and be like, I'm your boyfriend now, Heather. You know? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm your boyfriend now, Heather. <laughs> I hope the fucking oh tongue God. flick it out of the <laughs> end of the phone. Oh, my God. I would prefer if it was Stunk. <laughs> I'm your boyfriend now, Heather. <laughs> In the background, you hear the glass break. I I wouldn't want to date Stone Cold either, but I just wanted to hear you say that. And, and it, <laughs> it was it was every bit as good as I knew. <laughs> right. I I I I know I I know when to ask is less important than to just say. Wouldn't it be funny if? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I like it though. I mean, hey, you throw the ball in the air, and I may take a swing at it. Who knows? We'll see. I, I never said I was subtle. Uh, <laughs> I, was I sub- appreciate it. Subtle. I appreciate I'm that you're just like. You know, I would prefer if it were this. It's like, all right, yes, yeah. let's, let's do it. Hey, Chris, let me pause it. The situation right. for you. Yeah. Um. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's too bad, but I I hope somebody listens to this. I and I think any country. Indian, fabulous. If you're American, cool. Wherever you can be from Denmark, make a horror movie that's a musical that's creepy. I want to see this shit. I want to see because even my beloved Phantom, our beloved Phantom of the Paradise. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's scary or creepy. It. I mean, it, it is a horror musical. You're 100 right. Paul Williams like, is creepy in it. Oh, but but yeah. Come on. I'm with and nine right now. Flash nine and the mar- I mean, yeah, I get it. Like, oh, well, oh like, right. but he's a he is a interesting looking fella. Let's put it that way. Oh, but but you know what, beef? Can we all just uh, oh, swear Garrett over Graham Garrett just, Graham? Mm. He's so dreamy, yeah. and oh my god, and uh, may have may reportedly have what the the vernacular. I don't know if this is proper vernacular. Have a hog. Ugly chimp arm. I'm just. I'm, there's a Brian De Palma movie where you see, you see it all. I'm right packing. <laughs> I wonder what would have been this movie's outcome if the Nightmare on Elm Street stuff had been handled in a more not respectful but interesting way and less a one for one way. I wonder what that movie would look and I wonder if that movie would have been better than this because again there are other Indian remakes of things. There's an Indian version of Forrest Gump that doesn't just do the Forrest Gump story. It takes it and does something with it as Heather shudders and shakes and no, no, no. George C. Scott (laughs) hardcore over here. Turn it off. Turn it off. That's kind of how it was when you showed me the trailer for that. I was like, I told the actor, like I saw it like a family member of Puerto. I was like, oh. Yeah. (laughs) But, but, But again, like it's not like a remake of an American film by an Indian filmmaker is something that hasn't happened. But this it this this does verge on latent and this does verge on too close. Like, what's the point of remaking this movie one to one? Just go watch the original. Yeah. Well, and the same thing is they do add a lot of new stuff, but none of it is to a greater good kind of thing. Right. You know, I mean, that's the other than seeing more Johnny Johnny Lever, who's I mean, even though his character gets old fast like he's right i do enjoy seeing him um he's got he's a great least, jerry curl he's got an amazing jerry cole and, and he's a good dancer that motherfucker can outdance me right i can't dance that good 
He loves to I, dance, apparently. <laughs> if I tried doing some of those those like little knee moves he did, I would be on the floor crying because I have hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. he's the best part of this entire movie. Agreed. I hundred percent agree. Him and the lighting. The lighting the lighting was interesting to look at. I'm not sure it was Im- imminently successful all the time. It was very Italian lighting. It's very like giallo, like color like blue gels, red gels. Like they love the gel. blue gels on his face on um, Sh- Paul's was, face. I love a, I love the use of color and horror. I because I don't think I think that trend, especially when she gets to the nineties and the aughts, and even somewhat today now, most horror, so many horror movies just look so washed out. And I'm like, man, come on, guys, like you got a palette. They <laughs> love their realistic folksy look all right well either can say folk spun for her folksy oh, this is sick. ship lap i feel like that, that could we could make a horror movie about uh, call it call it whittle it's about a, a guy that whittles you know like the little sticks is whittling and he kills um rogue teenagers with his whittling i think it would be called whitlin whitlin and and oh my god no this movie's gonna rock i just hit me we have him played by stephen mccaddy or lance henrickson okay Ugh. Let's do Lance. Um, and he plays the musical saw out over the dead bodies of his victims. The That'd be so what? creepy. Have you, have you ever heard like a musical saw? Oh, like oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and then we hear we hear like and, and this there's this lo- there's this beautiful lonely lady. We call her the Lady of the Swamps, and she sings like all of these death ballads. And she's got a pet crow. This <laughs> shit is top. <laughs> I'm more interested in this. <laughs> no, I just I. Just, I just came up off the top of my head a better movie than my call. You're you welcome. Fantasy booked it better. And if anybody writes this movie, we will sue you because we have this shit time stamped. <laughs> Unlike the creators of Nightmare on Elm Street, we will sue you. We will go. We will go full Harlan Ellison on your asses. Okay. It's time oh, to get Lord. litigious, baby. Woo! Oh, that's a catchphrase. Yeah. Litigious. Let's get let's just, We're gonna make. We're gonna look at Disney and say, "Hold our beer, mouse." <laughs> yeah. Squeak, squeak, motherfucker. <laughs> oh my god! This is why I love Chris. Like Chris is the best. I no, try. Other, no other host is gonna come up with squeak, squeak, motherfucker. <laughs> hey, that's what the mouse wants. The mouse wants attention. Time to give it some. <laughs> oh. Here's your piece of cheese. Oh my God. I am living for all of this. Yes. Cheese. Yeah, well, I, I just love saying, you want action, we'll give it. <laughs> yeah, you want it. That's even better than my, my previous favorite phrase you got beef, so let's eat. <laughs> you got beef, let's heat up the grill and cook. <laughs> <laughs> Your voice sounds so much more threatening than mine. I feel like I still sound like a hostess. <laughs> like, <laughs> Hi, I'm Heather, and would you like some Southwest egg rolls with that? Yeah. Oh, uh, I highly recommend the Chipotle Ranch to go with it. <laughs> oh, it's actually pronounced Chipotle. Chipotle. Chipotle aioli. <laughs> That's yeah. the other one. Aioli. It's aioli, and it's pronounced Chipotle. Chipotle aioli, chipotle aioli. <laughs> what are you, screep? What did you call me? <laughs> yeah, everybody gets in a fist fight. And over it's... here, you chipotle aioli, aioli, I only eat southwestern egg rolls at TGI Fridays. You, you know the 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 Texas rattlesnake has been thrown out of at least a few Applebee's and chilies. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he has. I mean, when you when. I need to cook my Southwest egg roll all the way through. It's a little cold in the center. Like, all right, Jesus. <laughs> Give me more chipotle aioli. Yeah. Sir, you just did a stutter on our manager. We're going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> Guys, shake it in the back like the rock. <laughs> Jeez, he's selling it. He's really selling it. Uh, where's my goddamn mozzarella sticks? <laughs> Those mozzarella sticks don't have no cheese pull. Get out of here. It's like, Jesus, Stone Cold, what is your problem? <laughs> Sir, this is a TGI Fridays, not a WWF ring. The cheese bowl. <laughs> the cheese. Stone Cold talking about the cheese bowl would be... Oh I mean, again, that's why I stopped listening to his podcast, because it was like, went to Trader Joe's to get some orange cranberry relish, and they didn't have any. Oh, hell, yeah. It's like, oh, okay, you were cool at one point. Wow, yeah, that's sort of a lot, very lot. I went to Starbucks and the espresso machine was broken. Nobody yeah. cares. I need like, to drink I, normal coffee. Like, I, yeah. I, welcome to the real life. How, how does it sound like the whiniest white man on the planet? Yeah. 
but, complain but, about Trader Joe's. <laughs> right. And their parking lot. <laughs> All these people drive in Priuses, taking up the pig space. It's like, okay. <laughs> Calm down. Oh my god, he's all bitching because they're out of truffle oil. <laughs> yeah. Where's my truff? I can't make my risotto for Debra. <laughs> Debra. Oh, oh, this god. was more entertaining than the movie. Talking yeah. about this movie was more entertaining than this movie. Honestly, we should release this episode on Blu-ray and sell it. Because <laughs> it's a better, it'll be a better use of your money. But... It's an alternative to Mahakal. And, and Ma- to your point, though, that I think for me is the biggest shame in in this entire issue with this movie is there may not be another movie that is a Indian cinema version of A Nightmare on Elm Street ever to come out. And the fact that it's this is the biggest kind of disappointment because I would love to see a director who's actually motivated do something interesting with the source material, but. The likelihood that that happens is rather low because this would have been the time for it to happen when that movie came out and when it was more part of the pop culture discussion than the movie is now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it's and it wouldn't be the first time. Think about how many different versions of, say, like Dracula, speaking of horror characters that we've seen in different countries, too. I mean, like Japan, you had Lake of Dracula. Um, Jess Franco made uh, El Conde Dracula. Which was, you know, um, you, there, you have so many. I mean, actually, there is a, a tur- uh, Turkish version called Dracula Instable, which I, I think might be lost, but I hope not. Um, so that, you know, and, and that's the thing is every version of Dracula, by and large, is a little different. Even right. though it has, like, you know, source material that's literally a book in a lot of cases um, or, or play, uh, each one's different. And especially when you go region to region and it's like. That's what makes it interesting kind of to view different versions of Dracula because each one's something a little different. Like, otherwise, what's the point of remaking anything? I mean, that's why people are so cynical about things being remade now is because we've seen a lot of people remake classic films that aren't good. Like, not the classic films, but the remakes themselves. And they're a great remake, you know. Right. It's not because the remakes, it's because they're lazy. <laughs> I think, though... And I, I'll mention it here because I've mentioned it and on other shows that I've been on where we talk about movies that are remake. Why are we remaking movies that are good anyway? Why are we going and remaking movies that are like okay to middle of the road and really elevating them or doing something different with them or or something? Like, why are we just going, Nightmare on Elm Street, you're going to remake it. Rooney Mara, she's in. All right. Connie Nielsen, she's in. All right. Jackie Earl Haley, we're going to waste his time. Like, like that's what that felt like. And that felt like a waste of my time because they, even in that movie, they had an opportunity to do something interesting where it's like, they had a moment where they were like, it could have been that Freddy Krueger was actually innocent the whole time. And he was killed by these parents who were convinced he was a child molester and a murderer. And the movie has this opportunity where it's like, they're going to pull the sheet back and there, there's either a, a tunnel to the secret sexual assault dungeon or not. And it's like, if that movie had pulled it back and there had been nothing, I think everybody would have been like, wow, they've done something drastically different and now it kind of gives the story a different spin to it instead it's literally nope he was a bad guy and yet he did i guess with the movie strange logic deserve to have vigilante justice metered out against him but why stop just remaking it like one for one like the movie still exists jesus yeah. christ like well and yeah actually it's funny you say that because there's a point in mahakal where the dad's discovered having the the glove and at first brief second i thought maybe this movie's gonna surprise me they're gonna have this whole twist where you find out the dad is the killer oh okay and, but then that didn't happen so yeah that was i see and i mean honestly i think most remakes are not necessary unless yeah i think the exceptions if you're if the source material could use some improving it's kind of like i've always used this example like willard um like the crispin glover remake's really good and i mean the original one bruce davidson's fucking awesome like he's a great actor um is it like a movie classic no no i mean so it's okay or if it's based on something, because you can interpret a book or a play in so many different ways. Right. But otherwise, why don't you, or, or maybe just like, make stuff that's inspired. Like, it just is so lazy at, to me at this point of like, why don't we do this? You know, oh, cool. Another, another fucking Friday the 13th movie. Do we need that? No. Part of the reason why the slasher genre was so kind of like fascinating in the 80s, because yeah, people were inspired by the success of movies like Nightmare and like Friday the 13th, but you're getting people that okay we gotta make a slasher film that would be like ooh, let's do our own thing with it 
I mean, not every movie obviously did that. You got to look, but the ones that people remember and talk about, like say Sleepaway Camp, that's a classic. That's a movie that did its own thing 100% with it. Um, even something the like burning. Graduate. Yeah, The Burning, Graduate Day. Like there's, um, you know, that's what you should do. Don't remake, stop the remake shit. Be inspired. Use that inspiration to do something new that's your own in general. You know, like the, it, it's, uh, otherwise it just ends up being like karaoke after a while. Right. I, I, I yeah. uh, again, I totally agree. Like w- Weird Al is, is not making music that you or I could make because I think he's gen- genuinely a talented human being and parody oh, is absolutely. like, parody is impossible to do unless that's exactly what you are able to do and that's your thing and there are plenty of directors and filmmakers and artists of all kinds that do parody work better than anyone else can because it's so hard i don't know why remakes aren't viewed the same way as like it's damn near impossible to do this right yeah i mean and it, and it can be done but again you have to you can't just half ass it you right. really got to i mean like cronenberg's the fly is an example of a great remake, but it's David Cronenberg, you know, right. like you have, and he did his own thing. That's a hundred percent his movie. Right. That's what you have to do if you're going to do that shit. But otherwise just make something inspired. Like, I mean, how many, yeah, you know, how many cool, like weird atomic fear, uh, monster movies did we get in the fifties? We got a lot and some of them are better than others, but they're all inspired. That's how we got Godzilla and Godzilla inspired all of these great kaiju movies from Japan. And some are, again, some are better than others, but think of like the whole world that created like that inspiration. That's how we got Mothra and, you know, Gamera, which Gamera is very intermittent, <laughs> but he's a flying turtle and he's adorable. Okay. I know King which Caesar. one is your favorite. Oh, King well, Caesar? Mothra is my patron saint. Oh, I thought King Caesar was with those ears. Oh, he's so cute. I do love him. He's a giant dog that Godzilla fights. He's like a dog lion, and I love him. (laughs) I think ultimately when you have horror or genre films that can be, you know, transposed elsewhere, I think, yeah, well, it's, it's best to maybe not do the easy thing and do the hard thing because ultimately the things that are worth doing aren't easy. To just rip off Nightmare on Elm Street yields results like this. Where people are like, oh, this is a ripoff. <laughs> like, yeah. it wouldn't be a ripoff if they had tried. Yeah. Yeah, just try. And 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 honestly, with, when you're dealing with the supernatural, especially, the whole world is your oyster as a creator. Because you can literally write the own your, your own rules and logic because you're dealing with a fantasy realm. Right. Like, so there's really no excuse. Like, have fun with it. Let your mind run wild. Like, it's, you know, and it, that's the beauty. It's like if people try to apply logic, which some people do. I mean, we've all heard, I think I've probably talked about on on the culture cast, I'm sure at some point, or at least ran it to you personally <laughs> about like having, you know, I think this is died down now, but when zombies, when we were dealing with that zombie saturation, Never saturation. I legit people be like, well, zombies can't, you know, that sucks because zombies couldn't run fast and blah, blah. And it's like, they're not fucking real. How's that? Yeah. They're not. So um, you have a country too. Like vampires look a lot different in Japan as a myth than they do in Malaysia right. or Italy or ancient Greece, you know, same with lycanthropes, same with ghosts, you know? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. We have like centuries of folklore in every country that you can play and source from too. I mean, there's so much you can do. There's no excuse for laziness. Even if the film isn't good, if you fucking put in the effort, you have our respect. Right. Like I've never I'm never gonna fully shit on something if I can tell somebody tried. <laughs> you know, I might I'll be honest, I'll still be like, well, this some of this didn't work the best. But I, at the end of the day, I'm be like, but you know what? Good on you. Respect. Most people I can sit in a chair and bitch. Somebody went out there and made a movie and they did it. Good for right. that. That's awesome. You know? And I, I I, actually, I mean, I actually obviously similar feelings. Like as far as I'm concerned, I can tell just like you can when someone's trying versus mm-hmm. just like, here's Nightmare on Elm Street, but with Indian actors. It's like, yeah, yep, it sure is. And, you know, maybe if they had just remade Nightmare on Elm Street one for one and it had been an hour and a half and it had been this, maybe I would have liked it. Maybe that would have been enough. But I, I don't I I don't think it would have been. I think that this movie is, is you know, an interesting artifact 
of a time gone past when these kinds of things could happen. But mm-hmm. I just don't think it's a thing that would happen now. No. And I think there's a need for it. Like I've seen Tumba. That movie's amazing. And that's an Indian horror movie that is scarier than most Western horror movies being made. And it has nothing to do with any Western anything. And it's like, that is refreshing for me as a viewer because I don't necessarily want to see an American movie being remade in India and we're calling that good. Like, cause it's not good. It's not enough. No, no. Well, and it's an insult to like, you know, Indian culture and talent because the Indian film industry, obviously, I mean, you have a whole podcast about it. Like you wouldn't be doing a podcast about an industry that was shoddy. That was just you know, making movies like this. Time. Yeah. But also like, I mean, who has time for colonial attitudes where it's like, well, it's got to be the best. It's got to be American. Fuck that. If I'm watching a foreign movie, I want to see a foreign movie. It's like if I go to Italy, I don't want to go to a McDonald's. You know, if I go to other Bombay, than for the novelty of it. Well, they do have different items in foreign McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that, but 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 that's. I mean, but that's more what. But I'm it's equating. a novelty, no. Right, that's what I'm no. equating the movie to in a lot of ways. It's like it's just a novelty. It could have been more than a novelty, and all of it's it's all it ends up being is like, oh, if you watch this, you'll notice things that you noticed from Nightmare on Elm Street that will seem mm-hmm. familiar, but n- they don't give you anything else, and so it ultimately just feels like this weird novelty act where it's like, yeah, you're doing the nightmare thing with Indian actors, okay? Yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, no. So maybe somebody, I'm, I'm hoping this will be the year that we see an Indian horror film musical with Amir Khan. I could dream, okay? I mean, dream, dreams of Amir Khan running through my head. They're sweet. <laughs> They're so sweet. <laughs> Thugs of Hindustan, Amir Khan. Oh my God. He would be such a cute vampire. Like, imagine him with a little face. <laughs> the like... dandy daddy. Oh God, don't call him the dandy daddy. <laughs> daddy, 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 dandy. Oh, it's so, just like uh... Oh, I'm sorry. so no, 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 go for it, go for it. Oh no, that's it. it the it's a. It, I'll tell you after the show. It's a sidetrack. <laughs> so Heather, final thoughts on Mahakal? Um, you know, when it comes to remakes, you can definitely do a lot better. When it comes to ripoffs, you can do a lot better. When it comes to Indian cinema, you can do a hell of a lot better. Um, you know, there are good facets about it, as we've talked about, but it's just um. I, I mean, it, it doesn't flat out suck as a whole. I mean, I was able to finish it, but it's disappointing. So I don't know. It's it's a little bit of a of a loss, but that's the journey of film watching. You win some, you lose some. <laughs> I'm I'm with you. You know, I, I had been wanting to watch this movie for a couple years now, and like I said at the top here, I mean, this is a movie that I had been keeping my eye out for a English dubbed version for as long as I have been doing this podcast. So a while now, and you know, I'm I'm glad I've seen it. It is a disappointment, and in a lot of ways, it's a lot more disappointing than I thought it was going to. But like you said, I mean, it's like anything else. I could watch a Western movie and just be just as disappointed or more so. It's like I'm more disappointed here because I love Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, I'm just disappointed just the way you are. It's just is what it is, ultimately. Like, it is nothing more than the original, and that is a, is a lot of the problem with this movie. It's like, the original's so good. Don't make a movie that's a remake of a movie that is a classic. You just, it's... It does. There's nothing else that is needing to be said about that movie that the movie doesn't say on its own. And ultimately, this movie doesn't do enough to justify its own existence. And that's a shame because, like you said, I mean, most of the people involved in this movie wanted to make a good film, wanted to make a movie that people were interested in seeing and excited to to watch. And it's just it's not even OK. It's not even very good, frankly. And that's a shame. It is a shame. I wish it had been fun. At least if it had been fun, we could have been like, well, it was fun, but it's not even fun. It's just long in the tooth. No, oh. That's the shame. It's just meh. Like, it's bad, but it's more meh than anything else. Like, Yeah. Um, the one good thing is it'll remind you how amazing the original Nightmare on Elm Street is, and you could go watch that. It's readily available. It's a classic. Or, uh, or Hack-O-Lantern. If you want something campy and it's got high pike, and there's a musical number in it. I just remember there's a heavy metal like music video in the middle of it. And there's like uh, butt pentagrams. I mean, it's got everything. But it, except the Khan. <laughs> yeah, right. It doesn't have Amir Khan. <laughs> so until the next time we talk Indian cinema and possibly even an Amir Khan film, where can people find you on the internet, Heather? Well, um, of course, you can find me at my website, mondoheather.com. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram under at mondoheather and I have a Patreon. So, um... You can join me there at, I know this is going to shock you guys, at Mondo Heather. And as for me, you can find me at WeirdingWayMedia.com along with all the other shows that I'm both a part of or the network uh, 
is proud to offer Like Noise Junkies, which is a podcast that you host with Father Malone and HP. Hell yes. Come join us. Get your fix of sonic talk and goodies. Uh, and uh, we're actually going to be recording a new episode on Valentine's Day. So uh, keep your ears peeled. And we promise it'll be better than Mahakal. <laughs> That's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As for this show, BollywoodCinemaClub.com is where you can find the show, but like, rate, and review the show on iTunes because, I mean, that's where you're probably getting it and that's where most people are going to be finding it. So that's where you should go to help us out if you don't want to help us out uh, monetarily by going to where Heather's Patreon is or to the Patreon for the Culture Cast, which is, you know, more or less, again, part and parcel with this in a lot of ways. So, Heather, thank you so much for joining me as always. I wish the movie had been better, but, you know, like you said, such is the life of a movie watch. We all go with it. And that's, um, and that's okay. It's about not the destination, but the journey. Leave it at that. <laughs>